Very good afternoon and welcome to this online policy dialogue, creating a healthier future for our planet, the role of innovation and partnerships. We're very pleased to organize today's event as part of the European Green Week and in partnership with Apple. And we are joined today by a group of distinguished speakers. I will start with a fireside chat with Lisa Jackson, a Vice President of Environment Policy and Social Initiatives at Apple, who will be with us during the beginning of the event. And we'll then continue with the panel discussion with William Neal, Advisor for Circular Economy and Green Growth at DG Environment at the European Commission, with uh, Dr. Maria Mendeluze, Chief Executive Officer at We Mean Business, as well as David McKinsey, Global Director of PACE, Platform for Accelerating the Circle Economy. And if you are interested to ask questions, please use the space provided and we'll be picking up on your questions after our speakers have spoken. As for the topic of today, we know that creating a healthier and prosperous future for our planet, for our societies, will require addressing our environmental and climate challenges. And in many ways, we're on the right track. We have the SDGs, we have the Paris Climate Agreement. In Europe, we have the Green Deal, and its great visions for achieving zero pollution, circle economy and climate neutrality. But achieving these goals won't be easy. This requires a shift in terms of how we think about our economy, how we do business. This will require changing how we produce and consume. It will require changing our energy, food and mobility systems. And in the process, we need everyone to participate in the transition. We need collaboration across borders, value chains and sectors, as well as cooperation between policymakers, industry and civil society. Overall, we need innovative approaches to addressing our joint challenges. So with these words, I'm happy to come to Lisa as Vice President for Environment Policy and Social Initiatives um, at Apple. You surely battle with these considerations every day. It's great to have you with us, uh, joining from the US. And to get us started, I would like to begin by asking that as the theme of this year's EU's Green Week is zero pollution, what does zero pollution mean to Apple? How important is it to you? Well, thank you. I'm so happy to be here for EU Green Week. Um, to everyone who is here, thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I think I don't have to tell this crowd that climate change is one of the greatest threats of our time, is putting at risk people's access to clean air, adequate food, safe drinking water, sanitation. Um, so this means that the impact of the changes that we make, for example, becoming carbon neutral at Apple for all of our own operations, those, those extend beyond our factories and our stores and our offices to benefit people who live in the communities where we operate. And we're so proud of what we've done, but we have to go further. We've set a goal to become carbon neutral across our entire footprint by 2030. Of course, that puts us ahead of the UN goal of carbon neutrality as a planet by 2050. But on top of that, we've also an, an ambition to use only recycled and renewable materials in our product and our packaging. So first, we, we aim to build durable, long-lasting products to make best use of resources whenever we have to use them. But when a product is ready to be recycled, we're engaging with partners and designing technologies to recover raw materials that can be used for new products. We're particularly excited about the connection between carbon reduction and innovation in the circular economy space. Those two together are such a winning combination. You know, it has a direct impact on net zero pollution, which is um, a wonderful theme. It ends also though our reliance on fossil fuels with our carbon neutrality and our reliance. It ends our reliance on having to mine materials from the earth because we have a closed loop ambition to start with. Great, thank you. Apple is obviously, it's an example of a huge global company with a very complex supply chain. And in 
as it is very complex supply chain, you obviously rely also on others in your supply chain to achieve goals on zero pollution and carbon neutrality. So how do you work with your suppliers to achieve your goals? Yeah, it's really important, right? I mean, we, we are a complex supply chain and we're really proud of what we've done for our own operations. So now this ambitious roadmap that we have is really about our supply chain. It's about joining with others because we know we can achieve a lot more by joining with others. Um, so we've now committed that our entire supply chain needs to be carbon neutral by 2030. That requires innovation but innovation at scale, like designing and implementing new technologies, mobilizing financing structures so that this can be done in a way that's good for their businesses, and then rapidly deploying renewable energy. It's not enough to just pledge to go renewable. We actually have to get renewable energy built, connected, and used by our supply chain. And we make hundreds of millions of products each year. So the impact that we can have if we're successful, we believe is, is massive. Uh, we have a supplier clean energy program. We work really closely with our manufacturing partners to increase energy efficiency and also to transition them uh, alongside them to renewable energy for their Apple load. We have over 110 suppliers in 24 countries now committed to 100% Apple clean energy. Uh, that's nearly eight gigawatts of planned clean energy to come online. It's like avoiding over 15 million metric tons of CO2 equivalents every year. Uh, the equivalent of taking 3.4 million cars off the road. And we're seeing our suppliers get really enthusiastic about this. Um, across Europe, Apple suppliers are working towards clean energy solutions for their Apple productions, including Henkel and uh, Tessa SE, also based in Germany. Uh, DSM Engineering Materials in the Netherlands, ST Microelectronics based in Switzerland, Salve in, Be in Belgium, um, wind power purchase agreements, all the way to a solar carport in Morocco. So these are actually wonderful companies stepping up to do all the work that they can to address their environmental impact um, as well. Thank you for providing that overview and I think that there are a number of elements uh, on which we'll be happy to pick up in the panel discussion that follows later. Um, as we're talking today about partnerships and the importance of collaboration, how do you see, are we doing enough to address our joint challenges? Are we seeing enough collaboration between policymakers, companies and civil society to tackle our joint sustainability problems? You know, as a former policymaker myself, uh, of course, I know the importance of our policymakers. As much as business can do, I always like to say that we cannot do it alone. We need the leadership that we're seeing from political leaders in the EU. I'm proud to say also uh, political leaders now in the US who understand that our world simply cannot wait for an inclusive carbon neutral economy. So let's talk about business. Every business I think has a responsibility uh, to create a meaningful plan to reduce emissions. And we need to work across sectors to ensure that solutions are scalable and long lasting. Um, I think the circular economy is a great example. Moving to the, this kind of model is much harder than it should be for business. So we really need a, a change in the way we think, but also in policy, right? To make sure we have efficient, economic, safe material recovery that puts supply chains that are circular on the same footing as traditional linear supply chains. We need a system that surpasses all the environmental protections we have today. So people aren't worried that um, circular economy is an excuse for just moving materials around but not reusing them. And so we have to have innovation and we need to have our policy leaders uh, working alongside of us. And I think by working together, we will be able to realize you know, the potential of this of this moment of safe shipping, safe recycling, not com compromising security standards. Um, and you know, the last thing I'll say is that, look, as businesses, it's time to accept the science. Um, I don't know that anyone on 
listening today hasn't gotten to that point, but governments need to put in place ambitious legislation or ambitious goals based on a science-based reduction pathway. Um, and then of course, lastly, civil society can help play a role to ensure justice, to ensure that this transition is actually uh, part of a larger plan to ensure that no groups are left out, that whether you're a former um, miner or coal miner or work in the traditional energy industry uh, or in our country in the US where we think so much now about racial equity and justice. Uh, Apple is committed to ensuring that when we're growing new clean energy businesses, we're also incubating clean energy businesses amongst communities who may in the past have never had a chance to be a part of energy, or if they did, it was a part of the traditional energy sector. So that's why we're a member of PACE. It's a why we're a member of We Mean Business and WBCST, because we really believe business has to do our part to at least meet our policy leaders halfway. Excellent. I'm very happy that you picked on circle economy, as uh, I think that indeed it's a perfect example of as a transition that will not happen without collaboration, without partnerships. And as Europe, we as Europe, we are increasingly looking to promote greater circularity. A good example of this is EU's own or uh, the circular economy agenda. And as Apple, you have also closed loop commitments. Um, how do you see, how can companies like yours support and work towards greater circularity? Yeah, you know, at Apple, I think we're asking ourselves the same exact question that Europeans and the European Commission is even asking, um, which is how can we make great and wonderful products in our case, but how can we do it without taking from the earth, without taking the resources that honestly we must all share and we must share with countries who haven't had access to the same resources. So how do we make, but really cut down on our need to take virgin materials from our planet. So in order to achieve that, I, I think we have to think more innovatively about the products that we design and make. We need to partner with our stakeholders in Europe and globally. Um, maybe I share a few examples based on the circular economy actions that the European Commission has defined, for example. You know, we want to uh, uh, not use mine material, but we also want to do that without sacrificing the quality and durability of our products. So we're working on innovations in recycling to enhance material recovery and support circular supply chains. But those, those enhancements can be used by us, but they can also be used by others who manufacture uh, electronics. We set up trade-in programs in 25 countries worldwide to partner together um, with our customers to get more value out of their devices or recycle them for free when they're finally ready to hand over their old devices. Just in fiscal year 2020, we sent 10.4 million devices to be refurbished for new users. Um, but then at the end of life, our recycling robots come in to play, Daisy and Dave, dissemble and recover valuable key materials from our products. Those we're working really hard to ensure make it back to the next marketplace so that um, uh, they can, you know, we can really have this circular economy. And Daisy, one of our Daisies is actually located at a partner facility in the Netherlands. Um, and in the hands of the right recycler, you know, the iPhone that disassembled can actually be the material for the next iPhone. Uh, one metric ton of iPhone main logic boards, flexes, and camera modules disassembled by Daisy contains the same amount of gold and copper that could be found in over 720 metric tons of mined copper and gold ore. So as you can see, we, we love the idea of being um, not just a part of the circular economy, but one of the technology leaders. Um, when people think of Apple, we think of technology and that's what we wanna be for the circular economy as well. 
No, thank you. Thank you for this overview. I think that in many ways, what we're seeing and starting to see is a race to the top. We're looking for so, players who can come up with new solutions. And it's fantastic if we can find ways to collaborate and actually make sure that these solutions become widely available and that we learn from these innovative approaches on as we try to address the biggest challenges, uh, societal, environmental challenges that we face today. And uh, in that, it's great that we have operators, companies, um, and that we have this kind of collaboration taking place. So fantastic. Um, I know you'll need to leave shortly. Uh, so I'll wrap this up by saying a big thank you for sharing these insights and the ambition. And we'll definitely pick up on some of these points you've made uh, during our panel discussion. I think that one very interesting thing, obviously, as we are uh, uh, organizing discussion uh, as part of the EU's Green Week, is obviously the EU's regulatory framework. And uh, the EU has a number of tools available to try to make sure that we are going to the right direction. And the EU has in the past shown that it is a big regulatory power. So for us, it's very interesting to actually dig deeper into this as well and see where are we at the moment and what more could be done with the EU's tools available to ensure that we really encourage the need of collaboration and partnerships. So thank you very much. And thank you. You have a wonderful uh, panel. I'll see you thank later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bye. Lisa. And I would now like to invite our panelists to join, uh, to share their thoughts on the role of partnerships in achieving our set goals and how we can foster and incentivize needed cooperation and innovation in the process. So let's start with William Neal. Uh, so indeed your advisor for circular economy, green growth at DG Environment at the European Co uh, Commission. Can you give us your thoughts on why do you think partnerships are important? And if you can also comment on the role of innovation in addressing our sustainability challenges, as well as how the EU can support needed innovation and collaboration, that would be great. Yes, thanks very much, Annika, and uh, it was great to hear Lisa. I picked up on one of the things that she said particularly, which is that it, it is much harder than it should be for businesses to go circular. Um, and I, I think if you look at the many hundreds of fantastic circular ideas being put into action by innovative companies, you can see very many of them on the, the uh, European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. Um, most of them are pretty innovative and pretty viable in their own right. Um, they've found ways to tap into value retention activities and to make a profit or, or uh, to provide a service. But it's very difficult for a, um, a company to be circular in a linear market, in a, a linear value chain um, with regulations and tax systems and so on, which are all uh, really designed for a, a linear world. Um, so if we if we want to make our objective of transition to a circular economy happen, we have to find we have to provide the right framework conditions for those innovative circular businesses to actually succeed, and also for circularity to to become mainstream. Um, so we have to have systemic approaches, um, and of course that means getting all kinds of actors to work together. Uh, and it means using the full panoply of uh, uh, regulatory, as you said, we're a great regulator, uh, but also fiscal, investment, behavioral, all kinds of tools that we have at our disposal. And when it comes to circular economy, the clue is really in the name. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Lisa would remember the uh, uh, election campaign slogan, uh, slogan of Bill Clinton, it's the economy stupid. Um, and of course, hard and soft law, law are all part of getting the economics right as well. Historically, when it's come to environment, hard law has been very much about punishing polluters. And at the European level, in many cases, that actually means um, uh, fining a member state for not having met national targets, uh, uh, even several years after the targets haven't been met. Um, <clears throat> Charles Dickens said that uh, we only need good lawyers because we have bad people, but I don't think that we can really develop environmental policy on the basis that everybody is bad. Uh, and I think from what Lisa was saying, certainly Apple isn't a bad apple. Um, sorry for the puns. Um, so, of course, laws also have a, they're not just about punishing people, they also have a, a role in dissuading people from polluting and ensuring level playing field and in providing investor certainty. 
Um, and we certainly need to continue to improve and better implement our laws, but they can only be part of uh, any effective solution. We need to try to get the incentives in place to avoid pollution before it happens and to reward sustainable behaviour uh, and to, to internalise externalities. So in the Commission, we're working, as you know, in several ways to try and do this. Uh, I can touch on a couple. Um, but uh, having made that first point in reaction to your introduction, Annika, that, that we're not just regulators, we're really talking about the economy. So firstly, we're developing value chain approaches. And the groundbreaker here was the 2018 plastic strategy, um, where we set out to, to build a new plastics economy. And yes, we regulated, we introduced legislation to eliminate um, the most unnecessary and wasteful single-use plastic. We legislated to boost recycling targets, to eliminate uh, plastic from landfills and so on. But we also funded research and innovation in things like substitution, uh, chemical recycling and so on. We organized a, a pledging campaign so that we could mobilize the private sector actors um, to commit to using recyclers in their products. We committed to quadrupling investments in recycling capacity. And these kind of systemic and holistic approaches are really essential to developing circularity. All of, all of those bits of the loop have to fit together. Um, but of course, every value chain is different. And uh, in the new Circular Economy Action Plan, we're developing strategies, well, we will adopt strategies later this year already on textiles and uh, circular electronics on construction products next year. Um, as we, well, we don't, we no longer have Lisa with us, but um, um, uh, as we, we've been talking about uh, electronics with Apple, um, we've had targets for electronics for many years uh, in terms of collection of waste electronics and electrical equipment. We have legislation for um, restriction of hazardous substances in electronics. But I think one of the most important aspects of circularity in electronics is prolonging the lifetimes of those products. And even for an Apple, 80% um, of the impact of a smartphone takes place before the consumer even unwraps it. Um, but on average, we only keep our smartphones for uh, 21 months. So each 21 months, if you buy a new phone to replace it, that impact happens all over again. Um, so we need to ensure that we design for durability. We need to use regulation, things like eco design, but also we need to ensure repairability, upgradability, availability of spares, uh, availability of repair services. And we need to make sure that functional phones have a second or a third life as well, perhaps after being refurbished or upgraded. And we need to make sure that the markets uh, for that to happen are also effective and working. And we need to make sure that when those phones are no longer functional, the parts are harvested, the materials are harvested, as Lisa was saying. So regulation provides some of the answers. Eco design will be critical because it's really uh, so essential that I mean, so much of the life cycle impact of a phone uh, or of most electronics is in that design phase. Technology can be part of the answer. And as Lisa said, Daisy and Dave are fantastic. They can dismantle an iPhone in, in a few seconds. Um, but we're not gonna see that rolled out big time on a big scale if the economics don't add up. Uh, and I think Lisa was quite clear that, you know, we, you have to work also on making sure that the markets for the recyclers are there. Uh, you have to make sure that people are actually bringing back their phones <clears throat> to be uh, uh, repurposed or, or remanufactured or, or uh, recycled. So we need systemic approaches to link all of those dots. Um, and we need systemic approaches to, to, um, to bridge the split incentives um, along those value chains and to, to tackle the obstacles. So I think what is important here is that, I mean, as we come up to our circular electronics initiative, we need to have good input from stakeholders. We will have a, a public consultation soon. Uh, we've already launched our consultation on the textile strategy. So go and look at that. We, we need to have the input from uh, all kinds of stakeholders in order to really be able to have that holistic view. And please, if you've not already done it, um, go check out our uh, consultation on the Sustainable Products Initiative. Uh, the deadline for that is the 6th of June. 
Um, I think that the Sustainable Products Initiative is the most, the most groundbreaking approach to environment policy of recent years. We're talking about using single market tools uh, to, to make sustainable products the norm in Europe um, by applying wider sustainability criteria to products and to, to a wider uh, scope, to a wider uh, gamut of products. Um, so we're basically talking about harnessing the collective consumer power of 450 million European citizens to keep bad design and keep poor performing products uh, off our markets. Um, Lisa mentioned um, the importance of working with Apple's 110 suppliers. Um, one element of the Sustainable Product Initiative, which I think will enable that in many innovative ways uh, and across many value chains, uh, is the digital product passport. Um, so much of the value of any product now is bound up in the data that it generates. Um, so value retention actions, circularity actions really need that data. Um, and these days, most of it is lost. So we have the technology to track and trace um, those products, but we need an effective governance approach for data to make sure we get the balance right between uh, access to data and the privacy and IP protection sides. Uh, and we need to get all of the stakeholders around the table to identify who needs what data and when. And as you probably know, we, we're already piloting this in the in the new batteries regulation when it comes to electric vehicle batteries and industrial batteries. So we're trying to get it right already. Finally, um, and I'll stop here, um, just to say a little bit about the money. I mean, I think we have to admit that when the Circular Economy Action Plan was adopted last March, uh, March 2020, March last year, we probably over, over egged it a little bit. We, we said that we wanted to have a, a transition, an economic transition from linear to circular uh, economy. Um, whether the tools and instruments that we were proposing were really at the level of ambition to make that happen, you could question. But I think that 670 billion euros of post-pandemic stimulus funding um, was perhaps what was needed to make the difference. Um, and I think the Recovery and Resilience Fund should be and could be used to make that difference, especially as we have 37% targeted towards reaching the climate goals. I think translating that all our good circular narrative and good intentions into solid investment and reform initiatives is proving very challenging uh, for the, the national civil servants. And I think we need to work with the ministries at national level uh, to design the right reforms and the right investments to apply circularity um, to everything from building renovation to uh, rolling out 5G and, and, the, and the rest. Um, and I think that we also need to address a lot of these same things in our taxonomy uh, as we're trying to apply that to circularity. Now. But I'll stop there and then maybe we can dig into a few of those things in a bit more depth uh, a bit later. Absolutely. Thank you, William. As always, super comprehensive, uh, touching upon a lot of uh, important points that I think it would be great to pick up on. Um, getting the economics right, the importance of incentives. I also think that it would be interesting to get reactions all to the discussion around digital product passport, because obviously that does have global implications as well. Um, the supply chains tend to be global. So um, it will be interesting to maybe pick up on this and how can we actually move on ultimately uh, to a global system for that. Um, but also thank you for touching upon on the numerous challenges that remain to be addressed and also recognizing that circular economy is in many ways, we are, I guess, could say that we are taking baby steps because if we see that on the national level and the regional level, there are huge difficulties still with this. We certainly need partnerships and collaboration and different stakeholders to come together to work together and provide lessons learned but then also support one another in this and I'm um, happy to come back to perhaps we'll be hearing some good examples on how we can help each other in this um, in the discussion that follows. I'll move on to uh, Dr. Maria Mendeluise. So you're the Chief Executive Officer at Women Business and I'm happy to hear from you, especially if you have some good innovative examples of collaboration and partnerships that are taking place across borders, value chains, sectors, as well as between the different stakeholders. 
um, that you could share with us, but also feel free to pick up on any of the issues that have been discussed and mentioned so far. Thank you. Yes, I, I might uh, go a little bit higher and uh, talk more about climate change now, and then I will come back to the circular economy. I used to work at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and I was leading the circular economy uh, activities. And now Brendan, who's on the phone, you know, is going to make sure that I, I, I talk well about the work that we did together, and, and now he's doing wonderful. Um, so women business, uh, you might know, uh, or you might not know, as uh, it was created in 2013, 2014, and it's the, a very innovative as well partnership between seven of the largest organizations working with companies to address climate change. And it was created with the idea that we need to draw some alignment and convergence in the activities that we were doing. Because anyone that is from business on the call, but even also policymakers know that uh, the space is quite busy and companies can get confused. And so uh, our mission is, is to get to net zero as soon as possible and to have emissions by 2030. Uh, to get to net zero as soon as possible, we have done uh, interesting initiatives with our partners. Uh, we have the business ambition for 1.5, it's around 500 companies that have committed to be net zero. We also uh, developed the science-based targets initiative, which provides the roadmaps uh, for companies to set targets that are aligned with the Paris Agreement. There, there are around 1,500 companies there. It started very small and very, it's, it's growing exponentially. And, and more lately, we also partner with Amazon on the climate pledge. There are 100 companies that have said that they want to be net zero by 2040. So certainly around net zero, there is a lot of activity, action, etc. But actually now we just develop a new narrative because uh, you know, if we don't have emissions by 2030, you know, we're not going to get to net zero. So we're kind of changing now the speed and now we're saying, okay, you know, it's the next eight years. It is within the mandate of the politician or the CEO and we need to have emissions by 2030. We uh, mobilize business to be ambitious so that then we talk to policymakers and say, you see, there are 400 companies that send a letter to Biden to increase the NDCs because they are doing, Apple included, a lot in that in that space, and then they, and they want ambitious regulations. And, and so here we have uh, an NDC, 55% reductions in the US. Well, let's see that to get there, it is an incredible challenge from our regulatory perspective. So the Williams and the likes are going to be really busy because uh, there's a lot to be done here. So our new goal is that we must go all in for 2030. So speed accelerate action, reduce emissions, half emissions uh, by 2030. All in, it means all the sectors, uh, all business sizes, and all the people, as um, Lisa mentioned, so that we bring people along. So accountability is going to be really important. And in some ways, maybe what we in business does is that we create the, the conditions for companies to go into this race to zero, but also we create the pathways for other companies to follow. Because for us to beat uh, climate change, we all need to get to the finish line. It's not only about those companies that are more advanced. So let me talk, talk to you about the biggest challenges that I find and where we need innovative partnerships. So, oops, sorry. Okay, sorry about this. Um, companies, when, when they look at their own operations, they do wonderful things, whether it's in circular economy, reducing emissions, amazing. They're beating all the targets. But then when it comes to a scope three emissions, which are the value chain emissions, they're really struggling. You just heard it from Lisa, you heard it from William. 90% or more of the emissions of companies come from the supply chain. There are two things on the supply chain. There's the hard to abate sectors. So this is the cement, the materials, the freight, the transport, very hard to abate. And then there are the SMEs. And we have developed two partnerships that are quite innovative in, the, in that area. The Mission Possible Partnership with the World Economic Forum, Rocky Mountains Institute, the Energy Transition Commission. It brings around 300 companies to work on these seven hard to abate sectors. And, and guess what? Circular economy is a very important part of the decarbonization of those sectors. And it is included in the roadmap. So we agree on the roadmaps. The roadmaps are ambitious. They are aligned with net zero. They set the set of actions that companies need to do 
and then we work with companies to develop that. But we don't only work with the steel producer, no. Actually, what we do in that partnership is that we bring the demand, the, the, the companies that are demand of steel, so the car manufacturers. And we say, you know what? If you move to low carbon steel, the car that you sell is maybe like 300 euros more expensive. I think it's something that the consumer can pay, right? But then we talk to policymakers, to William, and we say, William, can you give them some tax rebates for those that buy low carbon steel so that we provide an incentive for that demand signal? And then we talk to the finance community and say, okay, banks say, investors, you know, these companies are really in the good pathway. Why don't you invest with them? So actually, we need to mobilize the supply, the demand, the policy, and the finance sector to get that. Um, and then, well, we can read more about Mission Possible Partnership. But let me talk, talk to you about the SME Climate Hub. So we launched this as well, and, and this is looking at the small companies that want to commit to net zero, but don't have the tools or resources to do so. So the same approach, we say, okay, let's talk to the Apples, the Microsoft and the Googles and tell them to engage with their supply chain, as Lisa mentioned, too, so that they can be aligned with net zero. Because the only way that Apple can meet their targets is if their supply chain meets the net zero. So here we have a very interesting collaboration where the big company needs to help the small companies. Let's work with the governments. Last uh, Friday, Boris Johnson, uh, Johnson before I think he got married, he announced the, the UK uh, SME Climate Hub, which is mobilizing companies in the UK to commit to net zero, but join our platform, which is the SME Climate Hub. And hence we have like 800 uh, UK SMEs that are part of this. And then the last element is let's work with financial institutions because as Julia uh, has said, there is these recovery packages now are going to be distributed. SMEs have a very important role and can access that funding, right? Let's help them understand where they should deploy that funding. I can talk about circular economy, but I think we need to move to David and then maybe in the panel, I can talk about circular economy and climate change. Thank you, Annika. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. And uh, thank you for providing that uh, comprehensive picture and starting with the big picture. And uh, indeed, we've been talking a lot about circular economy today and we keep on coming back to it. So David McKinsey, uh, as a global director for PACE, you obviously, you're very much looking into the developments with circular economy. So happy to hear uh, what are your thoughts on, on the basis of what you've already heard in the discussion today. Thank you. Sure. Well, I mean, a lot's been covered. These are two great <laughs> people who really know what they're talking about. Um, maybe I'll just uh, skip over the pieces they've covered and I'll just give maybe some really tangible examples, uh, some more like project examples uh, of what people are doing and how they're approaching solving some of these problems. So PACE, uh, the, you know, if you just take some typologies of partnerships, um, PACE itself is a partnership. So we're a coalition of WBCSD and commissioners from, the, from Europe, different ministers around the world, CEOs and others who really want to be the, the champions of the leaders working on the transition to circular economy. And the reason for this type of multi-stakeholder platform that is independently hosted is that you can have informal dialogues about a more progressive agenda. And you can start to work on things in, in a openness, in a closed, you know, in, in different types of fora and configurations to start to figure out how to tackle really big opportunities or big problems. And sometimes those are the same thing. And I think on circular economy, as William was saying, you know, this is a systems change when we talk about going uh, to circularity and it is long term. So in, uh, in one way you could say this is an indefinite game. <laughs> it is something that's going to take us a long time. And then how does circularity help us get to net zero perpetually, not just as a moment in time where we mission is accomplished. We want to get there and then stay uh, at a sustainable place. So, you know, bringing those multi-sectoral partners together, I, I can just explain a little bit about how we do that. We use an action agenda approach, which takes time. It's not easy. We don't hire a consultant to write a report, but getting together governments at different levels and different stages, different geographies, different types of economies with different industry partners, even though they're leading and championing, they come to this agenda sometimes with an economic lens, sometimes from an innovation viewpoint, sometimes looking to reduce emissions. 
and really try to find agreement and brokering where that agreement is and then where they can uh, work together. And that's how, that's how we function. And in a multi-sectoral setting, that's, how a, that's a type of partnership that can be effective. You know, we're not adversarial. We are supportive and enabling uh, of that transition where partners are willing to move now. Some tangible ideas, though, then we enable projects. So some of those are quite specific. So I would call these like joint projects. A small group of partners get together and decide to tackle a very specific uh, type of thing. And one is in Nigeria. Uh, we're working with the Global Environment Facility, UN Environment, uh, and several companies on trying to translate the success on EPRs in Europe into the sub-Saharan African context. And several countries are testing that out, but how do you, uh, you know, give one example, how do you pre-finance an EPR scheme in sub-Saharan Africa if the manufacturing and the original consumption is happening somewhere else? So the profit sitting in one country where the original consumer is and the manufacturing sitting somewhere else. Those are the types of issues, but it's a specific project. If you, if you just run development projects, you might think that's a pretty big, complicated project. But for, if you're looking at systems change, that's pretty tangible. Uh, another is voluntary commitment. So think about all the plastic packs that have been coming out. Um, you know, that's a very specific area where you can get voluntary commitments that can trend towards standardization in that pre-policy space or pre-regulatory space. Plastics is an area that's gotten a lot of momentum with like the new plastics economy with Ellen MacArthur Foundation of course, the commission and others. Um, but you know, you can look at other materials uh, and other industries or products lines and look at those types of partnerships to put together. And I think on the industry side, because a lot of circularity is about industry leadership. Um, and there are a lot of examples of different types of partnerships. So I have one that is often not thought of, which is non-competitive partnerships. These are rare and hard to find because you've got to find really unique people who are willing to spend time outside of their industry or outside of their value chain. Most companies kind of work very collaboratively, innovatively in their industry or their value chain. But we have one partnership called the Capital Equipment Coalition, which is you know, a healthcare company, a company working in IT, and a company working in agribusiness. They get together and share business models, and they can do that in a non competitive way and can learn. So that outcome is learning and knowledge sharing. It's not as tangible as you might get out of those kind of boots on the ground projects, but it has a, it can have a quite a transformational result inside each of those companies. And we're seeing countries starting to do that more as well. I think there's a lot more space for that to happen. And I think Gasseri, hosted by the commission, could be an interesting place for that. The other is pre-competitive, which is, you know, take Coca-Cola and Pepsi. They compete on beverages. They've agreed to not compete on plastics. So on plastic packaging, they partner through the Global Plastics Action Partnership to help set up uh, different coalitions in priority countries, Vietnam, Indonesia, Ghana, working on uh, different plastics and issues and promoting different agendas. And maybe a final point on this corporate side is Neil, William, you mentioned uh, uh, battery or passports. You know, there's the Global Battery uh, Alliance working on battery passports. It's an example where you can get businesses together across a value chain to look at what it would take to move a product or a material between one another, define what, what would help them, and that can help inform policymakers, not dictate, but inform a, an appropriate policy. And I see those types of partnerships really helping, for example, in informing government procurement, where there's plenty of rules and regulations and policies that can go forward, but that brokering between the market demand and need and the government capability to regulate in a positive way is not necessarily always naturally happening. Again, sometimes the money's sitting in the wrong place. The collaboration budget is not necessarily sitting with the procurement team. It's sitting somewhere else. So yeah, you have to have an internal government collaboration there. And, and a final specific set of examples is around metrics. So you go for those voluntary commitments to standardization. We've got great examples from emissions with like the greenhouse gas protocols how that went from voluntary to formal protocols. Science-based targets is another example. By the way, all these using Maria is involved in, in, in all of these things. Uh, and, and so in science-based targets, you know, you've gone to now science-based tools so that companies can adopt something that countries and investors respect uh, and, and can recognize. 
in circular economy, we're seeing that trend. So what's gone from bubbling up of different initiatives and uh, there's different private sector initiatives on measuring circularity, different governments, multilaterals, uh, et cetera, moving towards kind of alignment on definitions and integrating circular metrics in, into kind of standardized ESG metrics, for example, just taking the corporate viewpoint. So that's where a pace we, we have, we're almost the meta partnership. And there are all these different types of coalitions where we're trying to get leaders to move into spaces where action's not happening, but it needs to happen, where there's a need for harmonization perhaps, um, or integration, and then areas where there's a need for scale. And I think circular economy needs work on all three of those uh, areas. Great, thank you. I'm happy to come back to the other speakers or to each of you just to give you a chance to react if you wish to uh, what the others have said. William, um, do you have any immediate reactions you wish to make? Yeah, I mean, a couple. <laughs> there, uh, there's so much you can you can say about all of this, but uh, um, just a couple of things on, on what David was just saying. Uh, I think on the metrics um, <clears throat> and on science base, we're really coming face to face with this now in the taxonomy discussions. Um, uh, and we're, wherever possible, I mean, we really need to go back to science based. We need quantifiable, we need standards. We, so, but for, in many areas that doesn't exist and the metrics are so much more complex when it comes to life cycles than when we are just talking or just talking about uh, CO2. Um, we have our product environmental footprinting, um, uh, and so on, but really the, the metrics are so complex and if we really need to find ways to apply those through instruments such as a taxonomy, it really needs to be robust and it needs to be um, applicable across you know, wider areas, which is also often very difficult. There are so many exceptions. So we're really coming face to face with the nuts and bolts more and more now, having had uh, uh, a lot of uh, nice narratives and, and a, a few low hanging fruit we're really coming to, <laughs> to dealing with it in a much more systemic way and then when you mentioned the global batteries alliance and we've been in touch with them quite a lot and i think it's just a, a very good demonstration of how digital product passports um have a um private sector viable um um Model. I mean, the, the Global Batteries Alliance, well, David knows it better than I, is bringing together um, stakeholders all along the supply chain, uh, particularly looking at electric vehicle batteries and enabling, for example, dynamic data to travel with an electric vehicle battery can make the market work so you know exactly when is the right moment for that battery to no longer be an electric vehicle, but to be used for energy storage and to, to be able to know when that happens, know what the value, the residual value is at that moment, make the market work to make the transaction um, happen. And so there's, there's obviously, a, in terms of retaining that value, there's there's so much interest from private actors to be able to sort of find those things. And, that, and that's understood. Where we need to go with things like the battery regulation and the, the digital product passport uh, in general is to see how we can make sure that the public interest is integrated into that in areas where it might get a bit difficult, there might be trade-offs, there might be companies that don't want to divulge certain bits of data, which would be absolutely fundamental to other parts of the, of the chain to actually extract that value. So we need to be able to do that arbitration. We need to be able to get the stakeholders around the table, um, get them to agree on as much as possible, but sometimes maybe be a little bit more um, um, hard and legislative and, and impose some obligations in terms of access to data. And uh, Maria, Davis, any other reactions you wish to make at this point? Well, I, I think the, the issue around, around metrics is quite interesting. Um, so at the World Business Council, um, they're working on these uh, climate transition indicators. And they're working with companies. And it reminded me a lot of the work that we did with the, the World Resource Institute on the GSG protocol, where um, you have to see what is the metrics that work for business and to start first with the uh, understanding, you know, those metrics for the operations, so scope one and scope two, and then moving into the, the much more complex scope three emissions. And it seems as I was listening that we want to jump to those scope three emissions that are super complicated. 
without having the first uh, and solid understanding that companies need to have about you know, how they can measure, measure their operations circularity. Uh, the second thing that I, I didn't mention before, but I find it fascinating is, you know, I, I was the one who created the Alliance to End Plastic Waste uh, with the World Business Council. And now they're doing a similar approach, but this is with the Circular Electronics Partnership. And I find that the economy, as you say, William, is, is so much there, right? You know that in, in, in these cycles, there's so many precious materials. So I'm not sure why it has not happened before. And I find that, that um, what that we should be doing is try to do these partnerships in, in close collaboration with the governments, but the governments, because while those partnerships, some of them are private private partnerships, if accompanied with the right regulations, these partnerships can, uh, can grow to the full potential. And sometimes I have the feeling that the governments go on one side and then business go on the other side. And I don't think we have time to lose on climate or circular economy or any of these matters. So I think, uh, yeah, bridging in between those words, I think it's, it's quite important. And David, I want to give you a chance to react as well, should you wish. Yeah, I, I, I reacted during my comment, so I'm happy to save the time for, uh, for discussion. Very good. I, I would like to pick up on something. Um, clearly, uh, we've been talking today, we talked a lot about climate action, circular economy. And ultimately, uh, going forward, and this does link to the complexity of issue, uh, which will become even more difficult when we try to actually measure these. Uh, but we ultimately, we do need a comprehensive approach. And I just want to test, and this is especially a question to uh, Maria and David, how you see businesses um, in their strategies, as well as in their communication. Do, do you see that there's a lot of focus at the moment on climate action in circular economy? Or do you see that they also recognize that we also need to address, while obviously trying to promote climate action and achieve circular economy, that we also need to address other environmental challenges, be it related to biodiversity, air, water, soil pollution. To what extent do you see this kind of communication and understanding in the businesses' approaches to addressing our sustainability challenges. You want me to start, David, and then go yep. to you. So, so I think you know the sustainable development goals are fantastic. There are seventeen of them, right? And business normally focus on two or three, right? So, so I think the way that I like to frame it is is that there are three top <laughs> issues that business need to take care. It's climate change, the climate emergency, the nature emergency, and also the people emergency, right? The social inequalities, etc. And I think circular economy is in, in the climate and also on the on the nature side. I I think climate uh, now because of Glasgow and uh, is is very much on top of the agenda. And and the thing is that there are movements, and now the movement is for companies to be net zero, even if there are some criticism. Right, I find that the plastics discussion was very popular maybe three, four years ago. Yeah? Maybe now it's coming back, right? But um, the thing is that do you when you know do you follow those? I think sometimes it's, it's, it's easier to follow those trends and add messages. So I think that now circular economy and climate change need to go together in the next at least until COP twenty six, and then maybe you can differentiate both because there's much more movement. And then the connection between nature and climate is very vivid and one that we're working with business for nature uh, that is kind of similar to women business but for nature, right? And how, how do you grow within the business community? How can you help business understand that, you know, they can do both things at the same time? And there was something we did on circular economy and, uh, and that the bioeconomy, which was also fascinating. And I think raising awareness uh, for for companies on the fact you know, that in the case of circular economy, it affects all the sectors, is, I think is quite important. And, and one that we, did, we didn't men mention, and I think the companies are still not understanding is that um, for circular economy or even for to address climate change, we need to have this holistic approach, right? Look at the full value chain and see, and, and when, when, when reducing emissions on circular economy, you know that that you, you can do very little things on your operations. You need to work with your um, colleagues uh, or business uh, peers no? 
to develop some of those uh, solutions. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, David. You wish to continue? Yeah, I I would agree. I I would maybe add to Maria to your point on businesses focus on two or three SDGs, which 100% agree with. I would just add that if they have a core business in an SDG, that's usually added to those three you mentioned. So, you know, you, if you're in healthcare, you would have healthcare or um, food, hunger, those sorts of, of SDGs would get added in. Um, but as a cross cutting area, climate, nature, people, kind of the equ equity and inclusion type goals are, are there for most companies who are leading on, on uh, sustainability. Um, but I would say specific to circular economy, then you have certain businesses that are specific to um, waste management, for example, and they'll have SDG 12 as one of those core, this core of their business. But what we're seeing is an increasing number of companies where at least the sustainable production component of SDG 12 is incorporated into their business where we're working and encouraging and happy to talk with anyone who's working on this component is where companies are really reaching into the consumption part of SDG 12. And I think that's the next level of, of ambition. And that really drives towards the kind of the elephant in the room around uh, sustainability is that the growing population and growing materials. These are things we've known about for 40 years circular economy is a framing, both a narrative. I, I've seen SDG 12 called a messaging uh, SDG. So it's meant to send a signal that if you don't accomplish sustainable consumption and production, both, then we can't have a sustainable economy uh, over time. So I think that's the next uh, set of ambition. And maybe just a, a, a second point is on businesses, on, on circular economy at least, I can say there's a lot of momentum. It's quite different if you look at it to the regions and industries and materials. So for example, even if I look at, pack, at plastics, there's a lot of engagement on packaging, less engagement on industrial plastics. Even though it's there, it's, it's kind of just coming up. Maria already touched on the kind of hard to abate sector. So uh, still in cement, definitely there's an emerging interest among those, those industry partners to work where there's already been a lot of discussion, say on the built environment by architectural firms. Now that's got to translate into the material supply as well as, uh, and, and recycling, as well as to the uh, construction and development uh, partners to understand that as well. Um, and then uh, regionally, you know, this is sometimes, I, I, I'm an American, I don't know if you can tell, <laughs> even though I, I live in the Netherlands, and, and work globally, the um, sometimes circular economy is understood as a European agenda. But I think that's because of the label. It's just a, a label that's different. There's those long, if not longer, of a legacy in Japan. There's certainly a long last 20 year legacy in China around this type of work. Latin America, different countries have their own framing and language around circular economy. And, um, and you could say there's a lot of frugal innovation that is circular by nature. It's local, it's localized supply chains and those things. So I think there is a, what we're getting towards in circular economy is a, I won't call it a tipping point yet, we're not there, but we are at a early adopter stage still where we can start fragmenting and, and, and look, not fragmenting maybe the negative way to say it. We can start looking more specifically at different industries and their stages and move from, we're moving from individual action towards industry level action which is gonna be an important transition to get to kind of some standardization uh, and, and larger scale adoption uh, on the business side. Great. William, I don't know if you want to come and jump in, if not. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, there are two, oh, there are many things, but um, uh, 17 SDGs is a lot to, get, to, to go through, but I would think that we, there are two that I would want to draw attention to where I don't think that the uh, links are drawn enough and I think there are potentially very important links. One is between circularity and climate and the other is between circularity and jobs uh, and labour markets. Um, <clears throat> on climate, uh, Maria has also or already uh, really uh, mentioned the, the big ones, you know, the, the hard to abate, the steel, aluminium, cement <clears throat> and so on. Um, and there, I think 
the potential is very much underestimated, um, particularly in terms of what closed loops can do. Uh, Maria was mentioning steel and uh, you know dealing with the, the the car producers as well. A lot a lot of the problem there is because of co copper contamination in steel means that it's downcycled because it can't be used for what pure steel could be used for. Um, and by you know moving towards closed loops, you can you can really try to eliminate that and keep the the, the value and the quality uh, in the recycling loops. Um, and there are many other ways in which uh, circularity is linked to climate. I think particularly on the, the sort of the bioeconomy wing of the, the, the circular economy butterfly. Uh, there, are, there are huge things as well in terms of food waste, but also in terms of the way we um, produce food. Um, and then when it comes to employment, I think that the we don't have good data. We really don't have good analysis of the employment potential. Um, I would imagine that sort of intuitively, that the impact would be huge. We're talking about an economic transformation. We're talking about systemic change. We're talking about um, value retention activities, which are probably more likely to be where the product is based. And if it's in Europe, then in Europe, and uh, the possibilities for a lot more labor intensive uh, activities within Europe. Um, but there is a lack of good analysis there. And I think we really need to work on those connections. But just to say also, I mean, in making those links between uh, biodiversity, circularity, climate, uh, pollution. The taxonomy, sorry to go on about the taxonomy again, but it has been a very interesting process because in each uh, specific sector and activity, we are, you know, we're looking at substantial contribution, for example, in circularity, but then we're also having to look at the do no serious harm criteria uh, in, in the same sector for the same activities um, for biodiversity, for pollution, for water. Um, <clears throat> So uh, that has, again, involved us in really looking at how those pictures fit together. And in many, many cases, uh, in most cases, I'd say they are mutually supportive. But of course, you have cases where there is <laughs> um, a clash and there's a trade off. And that, that's, uh, uh, of course, difficult to, to manage. Great, thank you. Now, I was indeed uh, one of the kind of the thinking behind my question was indeed as, uh, some, one of these linkages that I often find is that it's not necessarily often made clearly enough is the role of nature as an ally in climate action. And indeed, it's great to see that there is this growing recognition that we need to do more to link these areas and see that actually by comprehensive approach, we will actually get much faster to the direction and to the healthier future we want. To the direction where we want to go. I'll pick on some of the questions uh, that we have seen our audience posing. And so there's a question from Joost de Kluiver. And uh, going back to the global developments, and I'll, I'll try to shorten the question a bit. So would the EU view a healthy future to be a European topic or a global one? And if the latter, if we consider it to be a global one, how do you see the role of Europe in collaborating with the most vulnerable markets on this topic? And uh, we've been talking about the do no harm. So how can we do no harm in those markets? Or are we aiming to do no harm in those markets? And if so, um, what can we do to support and invest in a health, healthy future in those markets? And also just uh, another question also on the global dimension and on the emerging especially in the um, developing looking at the developing countries is that we see that 70% uh, of all used devices traded on the formal second-hand markets eventually end up in emerging world and so I'm trying to shorten the question a bit so this means that over the last uh, 15 years hundreds of millions of devices sold on European market have ended up in parts of the world where e-waste is not collected so considering these trends and uh, the continuous challenge that we have uh, with uh, with addressing our e-waste problem um, do you see that there could be prospects for a global EPR system would that make sense or I'm adding on a question of my own, or would you see other ways how we can address this? Who would like to go first? <laughs> William? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, good questions. Um, so I, I think David said already that 
um, circular economy is kind of happening all over the world in any case, even if we don't always call it circular economy. Um, and I think that's because it's an inevitability. It's, it's, it's not really a policy choice that we said, okay, we don't like the linear system anymore. We're going to, we're going to go circular. Um, it's more a reaction to the global pressures of, of consumption. And of course, Europe has is in a very different position here. We're a big consumer. We have a, a huge amount of, uh, uh, of consumer power. And what we can do to influence the way those products are made includes using our product policy. If we can you know, use that to eliminate some of the, the worst uh, um, attributes of products and their design, um, I think we should. Of course, we're also working in sort of international organizations. We, I was talking to UNEP last week. We're working uh, with them on circular economy with the United Nations. We're working with um, and as with UNIDO and other uh, 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 parts of uh, the, that structure and with G7, G20, with, with China directly. We, 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 we are involved at the global level. Um, all of those different regions have their own motivations, but I think that they are all increasingly finding that circular solutions are adapted because they, they need to, to uh, decouple. Um, when it comes to uh, waste electronics ending up in Africa and what how we can deal with that, I mean, we uh, I, I was trying to be brief in alluding to how we need to get the circular electronics system to work in, in, in its many parts. Uh, we have the waste electronic and electrical equipment targets for, for, for um, recuperating that, but we're also looking at, so we, we've just done a, a big study impact for an impact assessment on um, the possible take back schemes and how we can incentivize take back so that you know, the, the electronic consumer devices that are sitting in the bottoms of drawers or whatever, actually getting back into the system either to be reused or, um, or recycled. We're also working on the review of the waste shipments regulation at the moment. So we work on regulatory proposals. And I, I, I said, you know, it's good about getting the economics right. I mean, that if if there is all that value, you know, I can't remember the exact figures. Uh, for one ton of iPhones that Lisa said can, you know, um, uh, replace 100, wasn't there 720 tons of, of ore extracted? Uh, was it? I can't remember exactly, but the the economics should make that work on its own you know if you can if you can get the incentives right in the system um that should happen part of that could be epr and i would say that getting epr to work globally you would need to have some kind of digital product passport um we've been looking at how um there's a lot of free riding by um uh not only non-european companies but many non-european com companies selling on markets um, using um, digital platforms. So when you buy online, uh, how do you know that the company that is making that product available has paid its dues, has paid its EPR fees and, and um, is not free riding? So the way to do that would be in, to be able to identify that product and for um, the compliance authorities to be able to uh, um, address those that aren't paying the fees. So. I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm very wary of saying that technology provides a solution for everything, but I think that if we can attach data to products, we will be able to make things like EPR systems work uh, more globally. Great. And Maria, David? Maria? <laughs> this might be off of the discussion, but, but I find that the carbon pricing has worked very well on climate. And I wonder if, if we should not also price the externality of waste, right? Because that will give an incentive for, for companies to, to produce goods and services with less of those products and that will derive in, in less waste. And then the, the second thing is that, you know, as European and now a little bit out of the circular economy discussions, but in the newspaper today there, or yesterday, there was the fact that. Um, I think it's now Britain, I think was exporting all, all the plastic to, to Turkey and the issues that, that you find there. I find each, <laughs> each country needs to, to manage its waste though. I think we just, uh, Europe, we need to ramp up uh, the facilities in Europe to do so and not uh, bring it to a country where it will be less well uh, treated. You know? 
And so good luck, William, on that. It might not be popular, but I find that we have that responsibility, you know, as European to take care of our waste, right? And not to, to export it to other countries. It's just um, a bit obvious. <clears throat> David, yeah, there... maybe maybe to just not re not repeat anything, I'll just add. Um, I was asked last week in, a, in an event similar to this, um, but not as great. That what would what would be the global pricing for the circular economy? And my immediate response was, uh, what would be the carbon pricing for circular economy? My response was carbon pricing. So. I think that is kind of a fundamental piece that we should scale up and kind of standardize and make make uh, fair and kind of balanced uh, but, uh, around the world. But the second is I actually think something more, is more near term than a global EPR scheme, which is um, this isn't going to solve the full problem, but actually seeing effective use of total cost of ownership in government procurement and corporate procurement. So. You can work on pricing and externalities for everything. That may be where that may be the midterm global EPR is the distant uh, solution or, or one of the solutions. But near term, we have governments that have rules and policies in place that they could be using more uh, and triggering some of these change and stimulating some of the market uh, incentives for the design transitions that we want by pricing in those externalities in, in their government procurement. So I, th I think there's some low hanging fruit here. Uh, that we're not seeing scaled up. Great, we are shortly coming to the end of the seminar, but I would like to finish up with one question. Um, and uh, I would, and this is obviously, this is especially uh, Maria and David, you're working on this, but what are key issues that companies should consider when looking to green their supply chains? What steps would you say that any company could make, could do now, could take now, to clean their supply chains. And I would also like to um, put in another question, should you have time to respond to that? SMEs obviously play a key role and it's not always easy for them in this supply chain. And we're seeing increasing demands for SMEs to provide info, information on sustainability, contribute to sustainability reporting. So how can big companies, bigger companies support them in becoming cleaner? So if you can integrate that in your response, then that obviously would be very interesting as well. And uh, maybe we'll start first with David, if that works for you. I like it when Maria goes first and then I get to think. Um, <laughs> uh, that's very really gentle, David. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, I think the first thing is that you really need to measure very well your impacts. So there are different tools on climate is clear. I think on circular economy, we, we have a, still a long way to go, but we are starting way, well with the CPI and other, other metrics. The second thing is that there are now a wealth of roadmaps, taxonomies, and, and so, so you just need to look in which sector you are and look at, you know, what is the, the, the outlook look for you to reduce your emissions or your impact. And then the third thing is that actually you need to double down your action, you need to accel accelerate, because um, because climate change is really serious, because we're going to hit 1.5 degrees in the next five years. It's just like, um, it's a no return, right? So the earlier um, companies act upon it, the better, because if not, there's going to be a lot of stranded costs. Because at some point, you know, we'll get like in a, and I'm not exaggerating, we have seen it with COVID. So you better prepare future-proof your business and, and invest in, in technologies that you bring to the roadmap that is available, try to beat your peers, try to be there earlier and faster because you'll have less risks and more opportunities as a business. And then on SMEs, I, I just love the SME Climate Hub. So anyone that wants, wants to work with SMEs, please contact me because we are going to do really cool stuff. So we're working with the UK government, but we're also working with companies in creating a specific, special landing pages in their, in their company pages where they can direct their suppliers to the SME Climate Hub. They can develop tools uh, for companies. And, and the thing is that it is on, on value chain collaboration. It's a space where 
collaboration is fundamental, but also it makes so much business sense because you're just not going to, to do like five tools. I think if Google does one, then Amazon can do something else, then Apple can do something else, and all the SMEs are going to benefit from that. So yeah, please come, come away for the SME. Thank you. Thank you. David, over to you. <laughs> now, now I have no excuse to have a, a bad answer. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with a lot of that on greening. I, I mean, Maria is just talking about it, that, you know, have a science-based target, do LCAs, measure your material flows. Those are the entry level <laughs> uh, next steps. If you're not doing that, your sustainability plan is not really robust and, and, and current. On, on circular economy currently, um, I think one quick thing to do, is you can pick up the action agenda that we put out. It's got what we, what our coalition of 100 partners think are the 10 priority actions and the shared vision. And that wasn't easy. So it, in foods, for example, in the food system, introducing and thinking about circular food is not the way that food systems thinking has been framed or food waste and loss. So bringing the circular lens, what's the additional value add by having a circular lens in that system? Um, you know, that's important so that you don't duplicate efforts that are easier covered in other areas. I think this is going to be important, for example, in the built environment. It's a lot of work that happens through building efficiency. There are certain specific things you might do additionally as a result of, you know, kind of applying a circular lens. Um, so I, I would just recommend picking up that agenda and giving us feedback uh, as it comes. Uh, on the SME side, I, I think there are two sides. One is um, if you're looking for stimulating ideas for SMEs, so if, if there happens to be an entrepreneur or someone uh, with a series of businesses out there, we worked on a guide with Citra, the innovation fund uh, from Finland uh, last summer on 35 innovative business models that are being used around the world across the different aspects of the circular economy. So if you want to see highlights of what SMEs are doing. That's kind of the go-to place. Um, a lot of times we do work and message around larger companies because they can demonstrate at scale. That's, that's the reason. It's not that they won't be disrupted by SMEs. And in large part, when it comes to circular economy, when you kind of pull back the curtain and see who's doing the work, it's usually innovative SMEs or mid-sized high growth companies that are working there. And that's why this is an exciting, it's one of the reasons circularity is an exciting agenda for some of those bigger companies is because it is new markets, new ways to look at products, ways to look at servitization. And those mean all new partners that need to come in and work with those businesses, but also need to be the next uh, large businesses themselves. Uh, yeah. Thanks, William, final word. <laughs> Well, I would say that the go-to place is actually the, the stakeholder platform for circular economy, but uh, there's more than one go-to place. Um, and just to say that when it comes to SMEs, I mean, our SME strategy came out uh, about the same time as our circular economy action plan. And in there, we say that we will roll out our network of uh, our en enterprise Europe network of SME advisors in, in about five or 600 hubs around Europe um, with particular uh, advisory uh, roles in circular economy, so helping circular, uh, helping SMEs become more circular. So um, we are uh, trying to to uh, address some of the problems for SMEs in in becoming circular. But I would say that the, I mean, I'm 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 not a business person, but I would say that from what I see, the priority for many, if they want to know where to start, is actually to look look at what you can control. Um, in terms of making your product last longer, whether it's through a different model, if it's providing it as a service or whether it's making it more durable. I mean, because whatever resources you use um, uh, upstream to, to produce that product, uh, if it lasts longer, then it has uh, a much lower impact. Thank you so much for, uh, for our panel, uh, for the panelists, for all of you for contributing to this very insightful discussion. Um, I, at least I have to say that I leave with upbeat. I feel that there is good momentum. There are good developments taking place. And that indeed, as the topic was partnerships and collaboration, it is fantastic to see that there are so many great ways how we can collaborate and work together across sectors by bringing different stakeholders together. And um, clearly business is very involved and it's important that we have 
leaders who are helping uh, the others to come on board are helping to create their supply chains because that can lead to a magnificent supply um, domino effect that can actually contribute to that system change that we so desperately need. So thank you uh, for you for participating in the discussion and thank you for some of the questions we got and thank you for Apple for collaborating with us on this event and wishing you all a very good afternoon and uh, looking forward to I hope to see many of you again at EPC events in the future. Thank you so much. Bye.